Hey y'all, Scott here. As you can see, I'm ready for any and all professional requests. What's that? Need a game console made? You've come to the right place. I'm the first person who is objectively better than all three major video game companies by complete accident. Just the other day I was making mayonnaise and accidentally made Geist instead. I hate when that happens. What if I was in charge of everything when it comes to making a new Xbox, PlayStation, and Nintendo console? Well, let's make one of each. For funsies! I thought it would be cool to try and come up with new features, designs, ideas, games, all that kind of stuff for imaginary future game systems. But don't take most of these as full-on predictions or desires or anything like that. Basically, this is going to be me pitching the concept of three systems. Some ideas may get a little crazy, but I generally wanted to keep things relatively believable in terms of what could actually happen. You won't have to give butterfly kisses to the Xbox to turn it on. Don't read too much into the following concept, they're just for funsies. With that being said... I'm naming this new Xbox console Xbox Infinite, what the Xbox One should have been called. I just think it was the next logical step name-wise after Xbox 360, and after Xbox One, I'll really take any name. The marketing writes itself, infinite fun, infinite possibilities, all that jazz. Next generation specs in this bad boy, while also retaining a lot of what the Xbox One introduced. The HDMI input for a cable box, for example, should be kept. It helps differentiate it from the competition and surely doesn't cost that much. Backwards compatibility is still a key feature here. All Xbox One games work while all Xbox 360 and original Xbox games made backwards compatible for the One work as well, with new additions coming too. Now, I'm not one to suggest bringing the Kinect back, but one thing that is becoming more and more useful in today's technology is the voice command. If the Xbox Infinite included high quality microphones that allowed text to speech while messaging friends, searching for things, easy commands like play some music, play this movie, what's the weather gonna be like? That would be pretty useful. Voice commands have come a long way since both Kinect models were introduced, and I think it would be nice to have this feature, and it would be more of a nice addition to make things easier rather than just a gimmick. The controller could use a few enhancements compared to the standard Xbox One controller. This thing is all right with a few problems here and there. I think making it wider and tweaking some material and design choices would go a long way. Making the controller rechargeable out of the box would be nice while also allowing you to use AA batteries if you so please. Who loves the fact that the Xbox One interface is a disaster and is both constantly changing to a confusing degree and much slower than the competition? Well, I'm a f***ing maniac. Complete overhaul on the user interface. Make it snappy, easy to understand, something simple and quick like the PS4 or the Switch. If we're talking what a new Xbox console needs, we have got to work on the variety and amount of sheer exclusive games. In terms of the amount, there's a bit of an issue. Microsoft introduced Xbox Play Anywhere, which meant that the majority of Xbox One exclusives would also be available on Windows 10 PCs, allowing you to play either version if you buy one, with saves and achievements transferring over to both. But it also means the Xbox One doesn't have a whole lot of true exclusives. We can't just get rid of this initiative for the Xbox Infinite, it's totally in the favor of the consumer. Taking it away just to make the Xbox Infinite more appealing with exclusives may backfire and make it unappealing to consumers simply because we'd be taking away this cool program. I think possibly making the Windows 10 version of these games available a month or so after the Xbox version could work. Of course, you're gonna peeve off PC gamers out there, but hey, if somebody buys an Xbox console, Microsoft's dedicated video game device, doesn't it make sense to reward those who want to play their games on an Xbox by making games pure exclusives for at the very least a month or so? The variety of exclusives definitely needs to be broadened as well. Halo, Gears of War, and Forza are all mega franchises and deserve all the support they get, but these are basically the only franchises Microsoft consistently pushes out. Every now and then we'll get a crackdown or something, but take a look at all the Microsoft-owned franchises and you'll quickly see that barely any are supported past one or just a few games and have gone dormant. How about a new Crimson Skies, Blinks, Jet Force Gemini, maybe a new IP thrown in there. Just some variety and franchise care. And with that, let's get into the game lineup. Here I'll be discussing the launch and first year of games. Just an FYI, when I discuss the game lineups for these consoles, I'm only talking first party releases. Of course there's gonna be third party games available, but let's keep it simple. Let's say this console launches in November of an unspecified year. At launch, I think we should put out four major titles, one being a new IP, 
preferably something you don't see all the time on the Xbox, a Japanese RPG maybe. A new Crimson Skies game, a fan favorite series, and being a launch title, it would get a lot more attention than it may if it were just squirted out at any other time in the console's lifespan. And rounding things out, a new Forza and a new Gears of War. Later in February, a new Crackdown game, if Crackdown 3 ever comes out. April will see a new Mech Assault game, July a new Jet Force Gemini, September the next Forza game, October a new Blinks, and November rounding things out with a new Halo. Is it perfect? No, but it's a decent amount of variety that supports a lot of Microsoft franchises that haven't gotten any attention in years. The PlayStation brand of home consoles have followed the age-old technique known as numbers. For the one we're making today, let's throw the tradition out of the window and start fresh with PlayStation X. Yes, there was a console called the PSX, but it was a DVR PlayStation 2 released only in Japan that flopped. Yes, the PS1 is abbreviated as the PSX sometimes alongside the PlayStation event PlayStation Experience. My point is, please don't care, just let me call my fake console the PlayStation X. First off, we're keeping things simple. The PlayStation X expands upon what the PlayStation 4 already established. Instead of throwing everything out and starting anew, I think it would be incredibly beneficial to design the PlayStation X to be a next generation PlayStation 4 basically, making it incredibly easy for developers to transition over and for consumers to upgrade. This may sound like the PlayStation 4 Pro, but believe me, the PlayStation X is a new console with specs on par with the next Xbox. It's a full generation leap ahead, not this half step of a console. The DualShock X is the controller and is very similar to the DualShock 4 with a few design tweaks and also NFC in the touchpad, allowing you to use your smartphone to quickly pay for things or for other actions. Available separately will be a new version of the PSVR. Better specs, resolution, a bit lighter, and it requires less cords. The menu is similar to the PlayStation 4, but allows for more customization. You can organize things as you please. Multiplayer games, yeah, if designed around it, can do crossplay with other consoles. Now, was that so hard? For the PlayStation X, we're going to be introducing the PlayStation Legacy Program, a way for PlayStation to combat Microsoft's backwards compatibility initiative, offering PlayStation classics from every generation of the brand. Kinda like Nintendo's Virtual Console. If the PlayStation X expands upon the PlayStation 4 architecture, then PlayStation 4 games could easily be offered on the system, no problem, even allowing you to use the same disc. Now, will you be able to use your old discs from the PlayStation 1, 2, and 3? Probably not, but it's still nice to be able to download a lot of these games to your system, and plus, a lot of these games would be crazy easy to offer as digital titles. PlayStation 2 games are already offered on the PlayStation 4, and PlayStation 1 games would be even easier to put out there. PSP and most Vita games shouldn't be an issue. The one system that may be a problem is the PS3. That console had such foreign architecture that it may be a bit too much of a hassle to get those things running on hardware other than that of the PlayStation 3. Of course, Sony offers PS3 games on the game streaming service PlayStation Now, but the PlayStation Legacy program will be all about buying and downloading these games. I think it's definitely possible for a handful of PS3 titles to make an appearance, but some may only be available on PlayStation Now. Contrary to popular belief, not everybody cares about portability or the Nintendo Switch in general. There is still a huge market of people who just want a powerful home console that stays right there in their entertainment center. I think it would make the most sense for Sony and Microsoft to continue down the path they're on with the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. Well, that doesn't mean they won't try to get a piece of that sweet Switch pie. And I'm all for a bit of competition. Sony is definitely the most likely to put out a portable console in the vein of the Switch, while with Microsoft, with the recent announcement they're developing an Xbox game streaming service, I feel like that will be the first thing they do, allowing you to play your games on your tablet or something as long as you're connected to the internet. With Sony, they'll introduce a Nintendo Switch-like device, but it won't be their next major PlayStation console. It'll be a supplementary, while standalone device. I feel like this would be a PlayStation X Lite, a portable system allowing you to play a wide array of digital-only classic PlayStation games spanning all generations, with a few select PlayStation X games playable on the go. If they're too graphically intensive, then you'd have to be on an internet connection to stream them. This would be a digital-only device, incentivizing consumers to go digital-only, as your digital purchases will work on both this portable PlayStation console and the PlayStation X, while games you purchase on disc would only work at home. You could probably stream the game with remote play, but digital purchases would allow you to play solely on your device. Launching in November of an unspecified year, the PlayStation X will launch alongside three first-party titles, a new IP, something mature, a third-person shooter maybe, a new Gran Turismo, and Ratchet and Clank game. 
Later in January, a new Tearaway game will release, focused on the new features of the PlayStation X. April would bring a new IP from Santa Monica Studios, an HD remake of Eco, much like how Shadow of the Colossus was remade in May. June would feature a new Infamous game, September a new Quantic Dream developed game like Detroit Become Human and Heavy Rain, and October a new Horizon game. The Nintendo Switch has proven to be quite successful recently. Currently, I think it would be best for Nintendo to build upon the foundation they've created with the Switch by either releasing a better version of the current hardware or years down the line developing a full-on successor to it. You can look at this concept as either one or the other. I'm personally looking at it as a successor, but for now, let's just refer to it as the Nintendo Switch 2.0. Why 2.0? I'm just such a decimal fanboy, and I think it sounds better than just straight up Nintendo Switch 2, I don't know. First off, we keep all standard Nintendo Switch games compatible while also upping the specs big time. Keep in mind, we ain't going anywhere near next Xbox or PlayStation levels, but definitely a bit above PS4 and Xbox One levels. If possible, we'll upgrade the battery. At the very least, I want it to be on par with the original, but hopefully we can squeeze a few more hours of playtime out of an upgraded one. Screen resolution needs to be better, not because the current one is bad, but because it could allow for a potential accessory for VR. I think we've all pictured this before, a head strap you slide the switch into for virtual reality. This can lead to some pretty standard VR, nothing mind blowing, nothing super high resolution, but something good enough to allow for the experience. Also, we've got to make at least 64 gigabytes of internal storage the standard for this thing. Finally, the dock can now output 4K resolutions, is made out of a much sturdier material, has more padding on the inside for those who are worried about scratching the screen, and more USB ports are available, hooray! The Joy-Con 2.0 are the new versions of those choking hazards of controllers. You can use old Joy-Con on Switch 2.0 and use Joy-Con 2.0 on the first Switch, but the features introduced in the new controllers are only compatible on Switch 2.0. A new ergonomic design is used that make the controller is much more comfortable to hold. Specifically, I'm thinking a more grippable bottom half. Also, the buttons and sticks are at a bit of an angle, making them more in line with how regular controllers are set up. Nintendo put out a patent for scrolling shoulder buttons, akin to something like a scroll wheel on a computer mouse. We're throwing these in the Joy-Con 2.0, as they can allow for easy item management and menu navigation in games. HD Rumble Plus is included, which is an even more detailed rumble than what's found in the original Joy-Con. And in addition to that, the gyroscope is updated to be even more precise, allowing for pointer functionality in games to be closer to how it worked on the Wii with the sensor bar. Now this is an idea that could give us a hearty dose of potential fire hazard, but what if your controllers could change temperature? Heat up a bit in a lava-based level, cool down in the snow world, or just if you yourself are hot or cold, you could change how warm or cool your controller is. I don't know, it might work and could lead to some cool immersive game design. Now one of the greatest potential benefits of owning a Nintendo console is the sheer amount of legacy content that could appear. Currently the Nintendo Switch is swimming in the convoluted way of delivering old games pool and we need to drain that sucker. Firstly, we'll be offering all generations of Nintendo games on the eShop. NES, Game Boy, SNES, N64, Game Boy Color, GameCube, Game Boy Advance, DS, Wii, 3DS. Even things like Game & Watch games, Virtual Boy, and other retro consoles, Sega Systems, TurboGrafx-16, Atari games, the retro game catalog will be immense. Now, what if you don't want to buy all these games separately and just want a nice sampling of Nintendo's history? Well, we'll be introducing a retro game streaming service, Nintendo Classics Now. NES, SNES, Game Boy, Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance games. All available for 10 bucks a month on an internet connection. And hey, you can buy them straight up to play offline at a discount if you subscribe to the service. I feel like you could reliably stream older 2D games like these with very minimal input lag, so limiting the service to these systems I think would work fairly well. Miiverse was a social network for Nintendo users on the Wii U and 3DS, and it died hard in 2017. With the Nintendo Switch, Nintendo just lets users post pictures to Twitter and Facebook, which makes sense. So many people have these accounts, and it's more beneficial for people to share Nintendo Switch-related content with everybody on social media, rather than simply everybody with a Nintendo Switch. However, I think a curated collection of social media posts made from the Nintendo Switch 2.0 would be really cool. Nintendo can keep track of what's posted on social media from the console and organize them on the console itself via an app so you can browse and see what other people are saying about the games you're playing. You could add other people as friends on your Switch profile, see other Switch related posts. I think this would be a nice way to bring the community of players together while also not having to create a specific social network just to do so. Voice chat on the system itself. This is a must. The Switch currently uses a smartphone app to handle voice chat and if you haven't heard, yeah, it's putrid. The app has some cool features and we can still support it and allow people to use it, but Switch 2.0 will offer straight up voice chat within the system itself. Also, no friend codes. 
God, no friend codes. Now, the Switch launched in March of 2017, and I think Nintendo would want to do that again with its successor. It worked out pretty well for them. In March of an unspecified year, we'll offer a brand new 3D open Mario game, much like Odyssey, but potentially something new and different alongside a casual game. Let's call it Switch and Snitch. A party game that would have motion control based mini games. One player will receive a vibration in their controller before the game begins and will have a slight advantage over everybody else. When the mini game is over, everybody has to vote on who they think was lying and had the advantage. After the launch, we'll focus on a new game almost every single month. April will bring with it a new Animal Crossing game. May will feature a heavy online multiplayer focused title, possibly a new Mario Kart or ARMS or something like that. I'll go with ARMS since we just had a new Mario game. Since we've already put out three major Nintendo IPs on the system, I think June would be an excellent time to put out something like a Wave Race game. Something not as big, but talks surrounding Switch 2.0 will definitely be high around this time. Putting this out in late June could work out, and early adopters of the system may give Wave Race a try. July would bring with it a new Pikmin game. July is a relatively slow month for new game releases. Put Pikmin out there and it'll be the star of the show. No game in August, but September would bring with it an HD remake. Maybe Kid Icarus Uprising, the first two Paper Mario games, f***ing Odama, I don't know. I'll go with Kid Icarus. October, the big one. A new Pokemon game, and something else. Maybe a bit of a lighter title, either a Mario Party, Kirby game, Mario Sports title, WarioWare. I'm gonna go with a Kirby game. November, a new Zelda game, based on Breath of the Wild's engine. December, let's end things off right. 1080 snowboarding. Now, of course, some of this may be incredibly unrealistic. Some of it may even be borderline insane. But it's fun to think about how you would do things if you ran a video game company and had to make a console. Now, most of this was just a shot in the dark, just random ideas that may, but probably will never work. The game lineups, the designs, the concepts, not one person can do all that but it's definitely fun to think of it, so shoot your ideas for new game consoles at me. But I'm not gonna need them because I'm off to Microsoft to pitch my idea for the Xbox Infinite. I'll use the power of Google Maps to ensure I make it there, no problem.